There Will Be Wolves by Carling Bradford, Chapter 8 The minstrels joined the crusade and sang every evening. The men drank and joked with anyone who would treat them to ale or wine, but the woman kept herself and the child apart. Ursula grew worried about the small girl. It seemed that no sooner did one bruise fade but another appeared. One evening, the woman herself had a swollen lip, and her eyes looked as if she had been weeping. Try as she might, though, Ursula could find no way to speak to her. During the day, the woman walked with the men, and after each performance at night, she and her daughter seemed to just disappear. April turned into May, and the farther south they went, the warmer it became. One afternoon, after they had made camp, Ursula determined to bathe herself as best as she could in the slow-flowing river. She had made do with pails of lukewarm water heated on their inadequate campfires long enough. The river's water would still be freezing, but at least she could wash her hair. She walked to the river bank. Several women were already there ahead of her, however, washing pots and fetching water. She turned back downstream to seek out a more private place. As she pushed through a tangle of bushes on the bank, she heard a soft singing. There, sitting on a patch of grass, was the young woman from the minstrels' group. Her daughter was in her arms. She was cradling the child, rocking her gently as she sang. Ursula stood for a moment, watching. Then the woman looked up and saw her. She made as if to jump up. No, stay, please, Ursula cried. Please don't go. I've been wanting to speak to you. I've enjoyed your singing so much. The woman looked back at her, then beyond her to see if anyone else was there. I'm alone, Ursula said quickly divining her thoughts. There's no one else here. My name is Ursula, she went on. We've come from Cologne. The young woman hesitated for a moment before answering, and then timidly pointed to herself. Elizabeth, she said. My name is Elizabeth. She spoke the Germanic dialect poorly and with obvious effort. She looked down at the child in her lap with pride. My daughter, Verdi. The name sounded foreign and strange to Ursula. Where do you come from? Ursula asked. Ursula pointed north, from far away, across the sea, from England. Why are you here? Ursula persisted. Why are you so far away from your home? Elizabeth shrugged. I follow my man, she said simply. That man, the one who is your leader, is he your husband? Ursula asked. Elizabeth's face clouded over. No, she answered slowly. My husband is dead. He died of plague. Lemmet is just my man. He takes care of me and my daughter. Without him, we would have starved, she added. There was an odd note of defiance in her words. He found us after my husband died. He took us in and taught me to sing. He takes care of us, she repeated. As she was speaking, Ursula noticed an ugly, mottled mark on her neck. Elizabeth saw her looking at it and hastily pulled the coal of her shift up around it. Lemmet has been good to us, she said, defiant again, as if Ursula had challenged her. Ursula bit back the words she had been going to say. Instead, she turned to the child. Verity, she asked softly, will you speak to me? She has no German, Elizabeth answered quickly. Ursula knelt, nevertheless. She reached out one hand slowly toward the child, as if luring a bird into her fingers. Verity, she repeated softly. The child looked back at her and up at her mother. There was another red welt on her shoulder. It had bled and was closing over in a pus-filled, dirty scab. I could heal that, Ursula said to Elizabeth. I have herbs and poultices. I know how. I could ease the pain she must be feeling. Elizabeth leapt to her feet and clutched Verity to her. There's nothing wrong with her, she said. It's just a scrape. Children get them all the time. You obviously know nothing. She clasped her daughter's hand and glared at Ursula, then turned and almost ran out of the clearing, hanging tightly onto Verity. Ursula, stung by the rebuff, made no attempt to call after her. She bathed and returned to their campsite, but she could not put the child out of her mind. The suspicion that Verity and Elizabeth as well were being maltreated by the man called Lemmet was strong. Bruno noticed her preoccupation. Later that night, as they sat by the fire, he spoke to her. "'What worries you, Ursula?' he asked. "'You've hardly said a word all evening.' Master William had gone, as usual, to the Count, in spite of Ursula's protests. 
The Count called for him nearly every evening now, with one complaint or another. Ursula suspected that there was not much really wrong with him, but having contracted for the services of a doctor, he was bound to use him. The strain was beginning to tell on Master William, however. My father, she answered, I fear for his health. He gets so little sleep, and going back and forth to the Count's campsite on these damp evenings is not good for him. She stopped speaking for a moment, then went on. I was thinking, too, about that woman, you know? The singer with the minstrels? She and her child were down by the river when I went there. What passed between you to preoccupy you so? The child always bears bruises. Have you not noticed? And this afternoon the mother, Elizabeth, she is called, had marks on her neck. I think that man, who is their leader, beats them. I have noticed, Bruno answered. Did you ask? No, I didn't dare. Absent-mindedly, Ursula picked up a twig and threw it on the fire. She is afraid. She would barely speak to me. She pushed the twig further into the almost dead fire with her toe. I know not what to do about it. I do not see that you can do anything, Bruno said. It is none of your concern. You, Bruno? Ursula burst out. You say such a thing? I would have expected better of you. You can treat the wounds if she will let you, Bruno said. But I do not see what else you can possibly do. The woman chooses her own life. But she shouldn't allow such things to happen, Ursula argued hotly. If not for her own sake, then for the sake of the child, she should leave him. And do what? Bruno asked. I don't know, but she should do something. How can you not agree with me? I do agree with you, Bruno countered, trying to keep a reasonable tone of voice. But it might not be that simple for her. Simple or not, Ursula insisted stubbornly. She should not stand for it. She should take better care of her child. I can't believe you to be so uncaring. She jumped to her feet and once again retreated to her tent without bidding Bruno good night. The mist was still hanging in the valleys when they set out the following day. The sun was out above it, however, and blazed a path across the water towards Ursula. She closed her eyes and raised her face to the warmth. It felt good, but her mind was still troubled, and she felt even more guilty than before about Bruno. But he should agree with me, she thought stubbornly. The next day it rained, and the day after that. For the rest of the time it took them to reach the Dunby, the sun did not shine again. It got to the point where Ursula began to feel that she would never be dry or warm again. Everything they owned was wet. At night they crawled into a soaking tent and curled up in damp blankets. In the morning they drew on damp cloaks and climbed wearily onto the sodden seat of the wagon. Even Samson's spirits seemed diminished. They sought shelter in their tents as early as possible every evening, often with only cold bread and cheese to eat. The wood and branches they could gather were too wet to burn for a fire, and the incessant rain was too heavy for them to bother trying anyway. The minstrels no longer sang, and Ursula had not seen them during the days. She was not even certain they were still with them. Her father's health was beginning to worry her seriously, however, so she tried to put Elizabeth and Verity out of her mind. She made infusions of mallow flowers and leaves for her father the best remedy she knew for the unceasing cough that racked him day and night, and poultices of black mustard seeds for his chest, but nothing seemed to help. One night, just before they reached the Dunby, the Count sent as usual for her father, but when he tried to rise, he tottered. If Bruno had not been near to catch his arm, he would have fallen. "'You cannot go, father,' Ursula said. "'You are far too ill. The Count will just have to do without you for tonight.' "'Daughter, I must,' her father answered, looking around vaguely for her sack of herbs and medicines. "'The Count must have his nightly infusion of keck. He cannot sleep without it.' "'You cannot go, father,' Ursula repeated. "'The night air is foul with bad humours and dampness, and it will surely rain again before you can return. You must not go.' The old man looked at Ursula helplessly. "'But the Count will insist. What am I to do?' "'I will go.' Tell me how to do it, and I will prepare his medicine and take it to him. Ursula reached into the tent and took up the bag. 
You? I don't know. The Count will not be pleased. Master William's voice faltered. It matters not one whit whether the Count is pleased or not, Ursula replied firmly. If he must have his medicine, then he will have to take it from me. Determined as she had seemed, however, she did not feel so assured when she finally made for the Count's tent. She had not seen the Count since the evening before they had left, except at a distance. The memory of his austere, formidable presence hung in her mind. It was with a great effort of will that she called out to the man guarding the tent flap when she arrived. "'Who goes there?' the man answered suspiciously. "'What do you want here, wench?' Ursula flushed with anger. "'I am Master William's daughter,' she flashed back. "'He is too ill to come to the Count tonight. "'I have come in his steed to give the Count his sleeping draught.' The man peered at her, raising his torch high so that he could see her face. At that moment it began to rain again. "'Wait here,' he commanded. Sticking his torch into the soft earth beside the tent, he disappeared inside. It seemed like an interminably long time before he came out again. Ursula waited, getting wetter and wetter. To one side of the tent a shelter had been erected, and a fire burned underneath it. Several men crowded around it, but made no move to make room for her to shelter there as well. By the time the guard reappeared, Ursula was furious. "'You may come in,' he said grudgingly. Ursula swept past him into the tent. This tent was enormous. There was room enough inside for six men to stand and move around with ease. The Count was alone, however. He lay relaxed on a pile of cushions at the back. Dry cushions, Ursula noted. Her chin rose and her eyes blazed as she stared at him. "'Where is your father, girl?' the Count asked. His tone was insolent. "'He is ill, my lord. He cannot come tonight.' Ursula matched him, insulting tone for tone. "'And am I, therefore, to be treated by a witch?' "'I am not a witch. My lord knows that, that as well as I. "'You are saying the archbishop lied?' The Count's voice was now dangerously soft. "'I am saying the archbishop was given false information.' Ursula held his gaze, willing herself not to drop her eyes. The Count turned away contemptuously. "'I will not be treated by you. Go and send Master William to me.' "'He cannot come, my lord.' For the first time her voice wavered. "'He is ill. Truly, my lord, he cannot come out tonight.' He looked back at her. "'You have my potions?' he asked. "'I have the herbs that he gives you with me. You can examine them yourself. All that needs to be done is to steep them in boiling water.' The Count held out one hand imperiously. Ursula reached into the sack and pulled out a packet of ground-up leaves. She gave it to him, furious with herself because she could not stop her hand from shaking. The Count opened the packet and shook a small quantity of the powder into his hand. He narrowed his eyes, peered at it suspiciously, and then sniffed it. "'It would seem to be my usual medicine,' he said finally. "'It is, my lord. My father prepared it himself.' The Count hesitated, then seemed to come to a decision. Ursula could see the desire in his eyes. The ground keck was a mild sedative, but Ursula knew that at the Count's insistence, her father added a minute amount of ground field poppy heads in their sap. Once a man drank of that, his need for it became greater and greater. Her father would not give it to his own patients, usually, but the Count had become accustomed to receiving it from his own doctor, and demanded it. Ursula had only found out about it when helping her father prepare the mixture that evening. Now she knew why the Count insisted on her father's nightly visits. When they finally reached the banks of the Danube, Ursula couldn't believe her eyes. All her life she had heard tales of this almost legendary river. She had imagined it to be immense and powerful, dwarfing even the Rhine, but in front of her now was a mere trickle of water, a stream barely two men's lengths wide, and shallow enough to wade across with ease. As they followed it eastward, however, toward the country of the Hungarians, the Danube began to grow. Other streams added their volume to it, the water deepened, and the channel widened until it became the impressive river that she had always believed it to be. It was wide and slow-flowing, however, with fields on either side instead of hills. This made the going easier for them and provided them with good campgrounds at night. 
Another problem arose, however. The mood of the villages they made their way through was gradually changing. Tales had gone ahead of them, warning the townspeople of the great numbers who were coming their way, and of the destruction and waste they left behind. As well, the crusaders were now running low on food and supplies, and were no longer content merely to accept what was offered to them. In a few villages, there had already been ugly incidents of theft and the f use of force by members of the crusade to get what they wanted. One night, when Ursula returned from Count Emil's tent, she found Bruno sitting up, waiting for her. There had been a strained tension between them ever since Ursula's outburst over Elizabeth and Verity, but Bruno seemed to have forgotten it at this moment. There is evil news, he said. They had been able to make a fire that evening in spite of a light rainfall during the day, and its face looked grim in the flickering shadows. Ursula sank down beside him and stretched out her hands toward the warmth. She was exhausted and cold and hardly heard him. Do you remember that a nobleman named Walter Sansevoir, Walter the Penniless, started out from Cologne with his own party a full two weeks before us? Bruno asked. Yes, I do, Ursula answered, still too full of her own thoughts to pay much attention to his words. Her father did not seem to be recovering, and Ursula had had to minister to the Count every night. The coldness between her and the Count had not abated, but she was gradually losing her fear of him. In its place was a growing contempt. The man's weakness for her drugs demeaned him in her eyes. The long hours of driving in the wagon each day, and the time she had to spend ministering to his needs, however, were taking their toll. It seems that Walter's men are suffering greater need than we are, Bruno went on. When they reached Semlin in Hungary, some of his men robbed a bazaar. They were captured. Ursula looked at Bruno, suddenly alert. Were they killed? No, they were spared, but they were punished. They were stripped of their arms and even of their clothing. The men of Semlin hung the clothing on the walls as a warning, and to complete their humiliation, they sent the crusaders across the river to rejoin Walter and his other soldiers naked. The townspeople of Semlin thought it a great joke, it seems, but Walter was enraged. He and his men are said now to be pillaging and ransacking the countryside mercilessly in revenge. Not even good Christians are safe from their fury. The town people will not welcome us when we arrive, Ursula said thoughtfully. And indeed, as they progressed, they found the villagers increasingly hostile to them. Not only were they no longer offering gifts of food or supplies, but doors were actually closed against them. Supplies dwindled alarmingly. Within the camp, robberies were occurring nightly. Matters became so desperate that, without telling Master William, Ursula and Bruno began taking turns staying awake during the night to guard their few possessions. Samson Bark barked and raised an alarm whenever strangers appeared, but after Ursula discovered a piece of meat thrown on the ground by their fire, she began keeping him inside the tent at night. The meat was far too precious to be thrown away. A dog who protected his masters might well be deemed enough of a nuisance to poison. There was worse to come. Walter and his men raided and murdered without pity when they reached Belgrade. The commander of that city fought back, however, and the townspeople, maddened with anger and despair, trapped several of Walter's men in a church and burned them alive. In a church? Bruno protested unbelievingly when they heard the news. His face was white and he looked sick. Ursula's mind immediately leaped back to the burning of the Jews in their temple in Mainz. Christians burning Jews, now Christians burning Christians, crusaders! Was this what their whole holy pilgrimage was coming to? It seems you're right, Bruno, she said bitterly, and this is the beginning. I would not blame you if you did leave us now. You are not bound to stay. She honestly meant the words well, but they came out flat and cold. Bruno took the mill. You think I am so weak that I would leave you and your father as soon as danger threatens, he burst out. You must think badly of me for certain, then. I am sorry you have such a poor opinion of me. No, I meant not that. Please, Bruno. But this time it was Bruno's turn to stalk angrily away. Late one night soon afterward, Ursula sat alone beside the remnants of the fire. It was her turn to keep watch. 
The rains had finally stopped, and even the nights were warmer now. But in spite of that, she shivered and drew her cloak close. Everything seemed to be going wrong, and the future stretched bleakly before her. Bruno had withdrawn further and further into himself, and would hardly speak to her. Every day, it seemed, there was a word of fresh atrocities, and their own band of crusaders was no exception. There had even been murder done within their own camp two nights before, and with every tale, Bruno's face hardened and changed until she felt she could barely recognize the carefree boy who had helped her carry Samson home so long ago in Cologne. Suddenly, a rustle in the bushes startled her. She leaped to her feet, ready to run, but a voice hissed out of the darkness. "'Please, don't be afraid. It is only I, Elizabeth.' Heavily cloaked and hooded, a form emerged from the underbrush. Spilling out of the hood were long tendrils of golden hair. Ursula had heard the minstrels again in the evenings lately, but she had been too occupied with the Count's needs to go and see them. Now Elizabeth stood in the shadows before her. In her arms she held the body of the child, Verity, limp and, to all appearances, lifeless.